This is mayor to be Gavin Buckley on the Maryland Crabs saying this is the best solution to a hangover. Listening to these guys talk, <laughs> I feel better already. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Fernay, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. And we're back here with the Maryland Crabs. We're coming at you from the Commons. It's a drinking episode. It's 7.30 on a Monday night. And we are here with a... We're going to 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 7.30 a.m. Um, Which I've done. Hey, we are here with a repeating guest, Alex Plein. Who was our drinking so, buddy last time, Yeah, too. I was going to say, how do I always end up with the drinking episodes? Well, I think that's, that's the only way we get you. you All came, right. You came here with beer <laughs> on your bike. That's, that's right. That's right. You bike. That's right. I don't have to drive. This that's could be around the block and I would have still yeah. driven. Is that illegal? Biking and drinking? Um, not recommended. Yes, I think it is, not. it is illegal. But you don't lose your license because you don't need a license to ride a bike. So, so they just let the air out of your sure. tires but, and say push it home? Yeah. Well, you can get drunken disorderly conduct or whatever. I'm oh, sure yeah, I can. I have. Plenty yeah. of... That's plenty of laws to take care of that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, last week's episode was great. We had uh, Gavin Buckley from his bed. <laughs> on the, Literally. It was uh, a good interview. It was a fun interview. Gavin was a real good sport. Still claiming that we almost screwed up the election for him, but almost I can only count. imagine how tired those guys are after They were that, so that, exhausted. That's... We went to the, that party the night. I, yeah. Actually, I wasn't planning to. My wife was there, so I went over to the party. And they just, I mean, they're exuberant, but they looked exhausted. I was watching it on Facebook Live, and that that was an off fight. Yeah, it was funny. I, I saw a Facebook post from Scott Travers, who's um, Gavin, was Gavin's campaign manager, from his girlfriend. And she's like, thank God this is over. Now Scott can wear a different shirt. Because <laughs> everywhere you went, it didn't matter. I mean, when we very first saw him back in, gosh, when was that? Last last year before he really officially declared. And Scott was there at the very first time, probably at the, the Ferris wheel one. Right. He had his Gavin for Mayor shirt on and whatnot. So it'll be interesting. He's down in Australia right now. He'll be back yeah. in probably a couple days. Yeah, he called he, yeah, he called call right afterwards to like, ask right. our permission. He goes, I'm going to Australia. Okay, is that all right? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. And just... Be back by Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> I got the keys to City Hall, yeah. but uh, I heard they're having the. Uh, they're going to have the inauguration. They're not going to have it at Maryland Hall. That's the rumor. They're not. That's the rumor. Hmm. I, I didn't check it out. Is that, that where it usually is? Yeah. yeah. Huh. I can't imagine it wouldn't be. I, I just it takes effort to find these things out, and I'm not going to make it. So let's just. I'm just going to call it a rumor and let everyone else do their own research. I mean, that's uh, that makes no sense because I mean the inauguration is on December fourth. Fourth. It's on the election cal- it's on the election ca- cycle calendar. Yeah. It's the first Monday uh, after the next month after the election. But it's- I'm surprised it won't be in Maryland Hall. I can't think of a different venue that would accommodate as many people who will probably want to attend this. You could do an outside thing, sort of like they did for Trump's inauguration. You know, do it on West Street. <laughs> yeah. Have people spilling over to the streets. Could be, but December 4th is kind of dicey. It's the day after my mom's birthday. I'm going to be a little tired. And you don't know whether uh, the parking garage will be open by that time or not when they're done with their uh, <laughs> so renovations. We're done with the elections, and now you have all the promises and all the rhetoric that kind of came out of that. And we talked about all of the debates and forums, and they all pretty much had the same thing. Because, you know, they, there was dozens of them for mayor that they answered the same questions over and over. And the one that came up, let's say we have a crime. We had parking. We had quality of life. We had... Development. 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 So, and that's why you're here is because we're going to talk mm-hmm. about development because, you know, it's funny. You So you sent, you were very studious and you sent us all these notes today going, here's what I'd like to talk about. I'm like, wow, at least someone prepared because we're not going to do it. Right. I did watch the video that you sent and I saw Annapolis had a cameo in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, after all the rank of the election cycle, I think it's time we can have a more nuanced discussion because, you know, I, I mean, I think it started for me on John Assel's first flyer that came out. With the uh, giant uh, cranes. With the giant cranes overlooking, superimposed over the view looking down Main Street with the headline, How Much Development is Enough? And I was going to make us think about that on Facebook because it really ir- irked me. But I said, all right, I'm just going li- to let it lay. But, it, you know, it really... <laughs> See, but was, it went from that to all the flyers we've talked about of who, who did or did not say what about some particular development. You know, all the way down to, in my ward, this business about, oh, do, is there going to be a cut through on Badger Road and the Navy housing? And yeah, it just got... 
out of control. And I think it, it just perverted the discussion of a discussion that we need to have because we're, we're going to have development. I mean, that's just the way of the world. And so we have to figure out, well, what, what are we going to do? And we need to have a nuanced discussion about well, it. I think the well, interesting thing about that is it's sort of like you find that boogeyman and you know, for it, for the right. for the it, Republicans, it's been used on both sides as a boogeyman. No, no, but I mean, yeah. for, the, for the Republicans nationally, the boogeyman was crime. You know, that that crime spiraling out of control, and it's not. It's, it's just not. But people have that feeling that it is, and you can show them all the statistics that it's not happening. And but it's a feeling. I think in this town, that is development. That you and I, yeah. and I'm pointing at John, we've had discussions about Forest Drive, and mm-hmm. John's contention is that the traffic is not as bad as everyone makes it out to be. I'm yeah, kind of I'd, be, I'd be in that. I'm kind of between John and and those other people because I think it has potential to be hellacious. I think sure. the lights suck. But um, so does Route 50. That's the point is that I, mean, I think, yeah. you know, so is it the perception? Is, is that the boogeyman? They're like, we, it's a wedge issue almost. Is that the perception right. that development's out of control? That's part of the discussion. The, the more nuance to the discussion is, you know, I think a lot of the planning dogma over the last 20, 30, 40 years basically equates one person with one car. And so if there are more people, there's going to be more cars. Development I grew up that way. I think we all grew up that way. But Right. I mean, but that's our generation after many, World War II. How many cars do you have personally? None. Me personally, yeah. none. No, I mean in my family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we have two. Two. But one, one sits okay. most no, of the no, time. No, no, no. I mean, you've got, um, you've got four drivers yeah. and two cars. So it is, yeah. it's, it's not a one-on-one. I mean, it is in my family. My kids well, are Well, I, I think... You know, but that's partially where we live in Annapolis, where you, you know you, there are other ways to get around. Right. But they're not. I mean, if you they're live, not very. They're they're but not if you easy. Lived, I mean, if you lived, you know, on the Broadneck Peninsula or in Severna Park or Montgomery County or wherever, you, hey, I'm from in, Montgomery in, County. A, in a place, and we can we can talk about these in a little bit about the reasons that you need to have a car to get around. But in, I, in Montgomery County, I took yeah. the metro to high school and the school, and I right. I didn't and, get my license until I was seventeen. Montgomery County said, I mean, that's a big. That's sort of a blunt statement because there are parts of Montgomery County that are not auto-centric and there are parts like out in Ger- the Germantown area. I was out there for a, an event this past weekend and, you know, you, you have to drive. But I've heard those arguments so, before from various people who, you, who will say, hey, in Europe they do this. They had, they had the bike paths and stuff. But my argument is, like, we live in the ex-suburbs here. We have, you know, Annapolis is between two metro areas. Our internal uh, public transportation is mediocre. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it, they make it easy. It's, you know, it's not that consistent. But even if I want to get to D.C. or Baltimore, I, you know, I can't do that. Yeah, Whereas I, if you're, so if you're in the city, if you're in on the coasts and even on the coast, you got to be in a major metropolitan area or the inner suburbs, like inside the, you know, the inside the beltway or whatever mm-hmm. the equivalent is in every city. But that's where it gets tricky, you know, so let's back up a little bit to, to the big picture, because I think what part of the. The issue in this, in the whole development discussion, is we almost reflexively go down to the uh, burr that's in our craw, and we talk about that because that's what's. I think in you our just mind. made that up. Yeah, what's the right? <laughs> it's uh, a burn your saddle and burn you got saddle and stuck the in your craw. Thorn in my craw, whatever. Yeah, sorry for the mixed metaphor. A burn not, in your craw. Um, would be really I will never let a mixed metaphor go by. <laughs> or, I'm, I'm going to pounce on it. You know, I could think of a better bike metaphor, but you know, <laughs> something. <laughs> Something about we call that, spoke. No, tainitis is what you uh, call that. Yeah, but we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> okay. Um, no, so, so what I wanted to mention about is the, I think of the development discussion has a lot of facets to it. So there's, you know, things like land use, uh, you know, which is, oh, are you going to have a commercial, residential, industrial? Then there's building form and development patterns. So is it going to be, you know, grid of streets like a city? Is it going to be curvilinear streets as in a suburb with hierarchical road networks? What's density? I mean, are, well, I mean, so street, the, that's you can have, it. you can have density or no de- or lack of density in any of these forms. Uh, you know, you could have, you know, a, a suburban curvilinear, uh, Loop de loops. Loop de loops with hierarchical road networks. It's from Ani de Franco. With low density everywhere except for a very high density housing project or a housing development, uh, you know, of townhouses or whatever. Um, and we see those all over the county. And I mean, I would turn that term that density without urbanism. So you get a lot of people in one place, but it's an island. So it's a, it lacks soul too. I mean, look at Columbia. Columbia. Sure. You could sure. pay me a living. So, so keep keep that and keep that in mind because that. You know, I'll relay that to some stuff w- within the city. So you have those. Then you have architectural considerations, certainly. But these are uh, these are these are broad. But I mean, the architectural consideration wouldn't all, matter. Would, no, wouldn't matter. Particular, it, um, it's weighted differently in downtown Annapolis than well, it would true. in so, Columbia. So you know, you can think of those maybe as overlays, like the historic district overlay. Right. Um, you know, and there are other overlays like. 
in the use world like maritime zoning, you know, you have to have a maritime use. And all those are very specific to the particular areas. And then you have transportation. Of course, that's what the development pattern's like and what the uses are directly affects the transportation. So if you have take outer the exurbs of Montgomery County, for example, if you have uses that are very far apart, you have to drive because nobody's going to want to take a bus because it's not very efficient. So if you have to go four miles to the shopping center to get a quart of milk, you have to drive. And, you know, it, so, so if work, your infrastructure needs to support that. Everything's spread out. And then the last, so you're, you're a good straight man here, John. So the last piece is... Well, straight, I don't know. Is, ...is the financial piece of this. So all of these choices that you might make in uses and, and development patterns, uh, not so much architecture, but in transportation, all have a fiscal impact. So... You know, if, if you have very low density, you're going to have to run, you know, and you have places where you have sewer pipes and water pipes, not because you have to run a lot of infrastructure. For a small amount of people. Right, for a small tax base. So, uh, you know, you, you look at Annapolis, and even Annapolis, for as compact as we are, uh, you know, even we're having trouble repaving streets that need to re- be repaved. So take the famous Bar Bud Lane off Forest Drive with, you know, they come to city council meetings, you know, for a couple of years saying, you know, our street's a mess, repave the street. If the city had money, you know, if they were flush with money to repave the streets, they would have repaved it. But it's not a priority. It's just a little tiny. Right. But I I mean, I think we have essentially more infrastructure than we can maintain. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you think about. Well, so I mean, there's there's, there's lots of case studies on this where if you take the classical cul-de-sac where maybe you have 10 houses, the the street there is owned by the city, is maintained by the city, all the infrastructure is maintained by the city. That infrastructure is for the exclusive use of, say, those 10 houses. Right. And if it's a new development, developer pays, you know, hey, we get all this free infrastructure. That's great. So for 20 or 30 years, while it's working right, it's free money. It's like so buying you, someone you get, a puppy. You get the, right. You get, those, you get that tax revenue. But are they, you know, are places like Annapolis taking that tax revenue, putting it in the bank, and waiting for the time that you have to rebuild that sewer pipe in 30 years? No. no. So, you know, that's going to be a problem. And then if you actually did the calculation of, say, what does it cost to repave the street? And then look at the tax revenue that you get. The tax revenue isn't even going to pay to repave that street every 30 years. And so that's just repaving. It's not accounting for the sewers and the water and any of that. Well, you've seen seen responses to that in D.C. and other cities where you have the bids, the business improvement districts. Those are the groups of businesses that live with that are established, let's say, like on Inner West Street. And you don't quite have that with what Gavin had established there, but it's kind of along that direction where they, they kind of tax themselves for the most part. And then if they need an improvement like that, they make that improvement because they can't count on the city to do it. I'm probably grossly oversimplifying it and maybe even getting wrong. Yeah. But again, research is But so gonna... So part of it is you have to think about development patterns that, you know, essentially maximize the use of public infrastructure. So in an article that I wrote, I think I sent to you guys about the Taco Bell on West Street right. that was put in. So if you look at whatever was put in there, the city has a certain amount of infrastructure they have to maintain. So, you know, whatever they have, 150 feet of frontage, there's stuff they I have to maintain. They sidewalks there. and curbs and roads. And all and that stuff. So regardless of what goes on there, the, the city has a liability. So the question is, what do you want to put on there? What kind of development do you want to put on there that's going to maximize the return on investment of that public infrastructure. Is it a place like, and the, the comparison I did is you look at Ram's Head, and you look at what they pay in taxes, the valuation of the, of the building and the land and what they pay in taxes, divide that by the square footage of the lot, you come up with a value per acre, essentially, mm-hmm. of you know what, what the city is gaining in revenue per acre. Contrast that with the brand new Taco Bell, and it's about a six to one difference because well, you know part of the deal is most of the lot where the Taco Bell is is a parking lot. Parking lots pay very little, very little taxes. Well, also so, I think as you in the concentric circle going away from the city center out, which I think. But, but I would say I would say even the buildings, the, the the old whiskey was there. I would term so this this concept we call financial productivity, of you know essentially. The, yes, that's what we call it. So I never called it that. I would say the whiskey was financially more. Productive then. Just because it was a larger building? Uh, yeah. It was a bigger be- building that brought in but more taxes. On, but, the, but aren't you paying on that entire property? Well, so so this gets into sort of tax law where we pay uh, my for... my specialty. <laughs> we pay for the inherent value. That this Part of the tax is based on the inherent value of the land and parts based on the improved value. Typically, we tax the improved value more. So if you have a lot 
and you can get revenue to make out of making a parking lot, you're going to leave it a parking lot because you you get revenue, you pay very few taxes. There's no incentive to, to improve improving. that. So, you know, if you if you flip-flop that around and you base the tax revenue on the inherent value of the land, so take take a piece of land in Inner West Street that's a parking lot now. If you were taxed on the inherent value of that land because it's in a sweet spot in downtown and you're only making, you know, what, 200 bucks a day on charging for parking, you'd be like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to build a building there and get the highest, best use out of that land. But there's no incentive to do that because you essentially maximize your revenue, the revenue you get minus the taxes you pay by having a parking lot. Is that the incentive we want to have in the city? So what's so, the solution to that? Well, what would you propose for the top? Well, I mean, so you have to address that at the county level because our taxes work at the county level. And I think the, the county is going to run into the same problem. They need to start flip-flopping that. What would you have proposed so, for the Taco Bell? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a developer, but it, it actually it has nothing to do with the program, and that's what I said in my article. I, I don't care what's in there. It's more about the form of the building, and I think as redevelopment happens out, you know, as we see in the Upper West Street study, as redevelopment happens there, and that area gets more popular, and the the land becomes more valuable, there are going to be higher and better uses for that land than a a drive-through restaurant and it's and it's not even so much that it's a drive-through restaurant it's the form of that building that really got me it's, it's just not a good use of but now you're running space. into land use issues or yeah. land use rights i'm sorry so you know if i own property use rights so you're talking about development in so much as what should be permitted to be built there and if i'm owning the property i'm like well wait a minute it doesn't matter to me because it's my property the taxes are secondary right. in to, right but all but what the zoning says you can do there, th- that's, a inherent, that's a governmental function to set that policy. True. So, so you think about how, how our planning and process works. So we do these, we have the co- comprehensive plan. Right. And we have these sector well, studies. It's on a shelf somewhere, yeah. Well, I mean, so, so that's what I want to get at is that we have the, we have the comprehensive plan, we have the, the sector studies, which are essentially like a framework. You know what, hold on. Let, but the, but, they're, but they're, the, the, the key th- piece about those is their advisory. Let's, There's nothing statutory in those. You have to get down to the, the nitty gritty. If you ever comb through our zoning code, oh, I have. code, I do it all the time. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you and me both. <laughs> that's where the rubber meets the road because that's statutory. That's what when a developer comes in, he, they have to look at those requirements, and that's what's going to determine what actually gets built. So we can have all this great stuff in this, these comprehensive plans that say we want it to look like this, we want it to look like that, we want it to function this way. But if the code doesn't actually say do it that way, you get something different. Let's that. take a huge so, step backward okay. uh, because we refer to the master plan in passing several times over the last yeah, ninety the, the, the episodes. The comprehensive plan. The, I'm sorry, the comprehensive. Yeah. Uh-huh. So let's talk about that for what uh-huh. what people so people understand exactly what it was because i think that's a wonkish thing it was i think 2009 was yeah when, so municipalities have to do it every 10 years and at five so years we're, they we're almost due there. for next for another one yeah they just last year by state law last uh, i think that's I in the think, i think it's in the charter for the city oh, okay yeah. So he just was it last year or the year before we had a five year update that Sally and it would have been presented. it would have been uh, three years ago because we're two years out from the next yeah, one. So we're, we're, it's it's coming up. So we have these plans that you know I think of them as as big picture visions. So, they, so they the commission came in. They, they, well, they generally get a consultant to do that. So planning and zoning. So this is Sally Nash's bailiwick as chief of comprehensive planning. That's such a great word. Chief of con- oh bailiwick. Bailiwick. Oh. <laughs> so they, they typically hire a, a consultant to run both the comprehensive plan and then these area small plans. So at the county level, we have an analogy that's the general development plan and then small area plans at the county level. But in the city, we have we have the comprehensive plan and then sector studies. So we did one for West Annapolis. Um, downtown, downtown, Forest Drive's working Eastport, on there right now. Forest Drive, and so the, you know that 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 way they, you can specialize on the context of those areas, and they might have different recommendations because each neighborhood is a little bit different, um, right? And, and they should be because they all have their own personalities and different how strengths, does, weaknesses. How does, how does a comprehensive so, plan get developed? Okay, you've got a, a consultant that comes in that. That facilitates this. I mean, what public? Yeah, they have public meetings, and you know, depending on the consultant that's hired, a lot of times you'll hear the word charrette, which is I love that word. We have that word, the market house I all the time. Yeah, which is which is a word sort of in the new urbanism world. It's French for is, meet a lot and don't do anything. <laughs> Which is Charettes. the idea of getting yeah getting people to give their input really yeah. in a sort of collaborative manner. The very first time I heard it was with Ellen Moyer in the Market House. We're going to have a charrette. Yes, and I'm like, 
the hell is this? You had to go to the dictionary. So, But it's, <laughs> you know, it, it is, you know, if you ask a consultant about that, they'll say there's something very special about the way people participate. And it's, it's much more participatory than having a public meeting that you put up some boards, you ask for people's comment, and then you take True, but folks groups are, they're kind of bullshit just it, because you will have a few vocal yeah. po- personalities in each focus group who will dominate the conversation. And you think that right. is representative of the public at large. And it's yeah. generally and, not. And Tourette's, are, I think, are only as good as the people that run them. Yeah, they, even, you know, they even, have even, to be, even then, I think. They have to be run well, and they have to get the right people If there you listen and, to the people of Annapolis, you know, they want thing. fresh fruits and vegetables and meat and everything out of the market house, and that's <laughs> bull. They yeah. don't. Right. They do not. Anyway, so, but yeah, back to the planning process. So if you read the comprehensive plans, it's fairly top level and it has, you know, goals and objectives, but it doesn't get down to the nitty gritty. And even in the, the sector studies, they have goals and objectives and often some recommendations to change, you know, maybe change the uses in the zoning for the particular area or something like that, that that comes out of those. So we have a big, we have a big study that comes out that was purchased from a consultancy that they come in. They look at the cities in large, and they look at sectors within the city to make recommendations. Yeah, those are typically separate. The separate ones? Yeah. Well, I mean, the comprehensive plan is a separate activity from the sector gotcha. studies that are done. So we have different contractors. So after they leave, and we write them the check, and they take off, we have the comprehensive plan that sits on a shelf somewhere in City Hall. Well, so they, they actually have it's, to it's get a plan it, to move forward. It has to, get, it has to get approved by City Council, and they either bless it or they don't bless it. And if they don't bless it, I don't know what they do. They go back and do it again. I, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, they write the check and start it. So what did our city, what did our comprehensive uh, study say in 2009? Boy, that's a whole podcast in and of itself. But we, I got, think, we got beer. We got but I think a lot, a lot of it talks about what the place should look like. You know, what's the vision of what the city should look like? What's so essentially the they, the made buildings? A, they made a grocery list while hungry. I mean, right? well, or that's kind of, that's you know, yeah, all sorts yeah, of how the city should function. But it's ultimately it's just advisory. It's a it's a framework to help guide the city policymakers. OK, if we're going to change our zoning code, is it consistent with what's said in the compre- in the comprehensive plan? But the plan Does itself, anyone ever do that? Do, I mean, do you? Yeah, you, I mean, you hear that. In, in, no, I mean, seriously. I mean, do, do you talk about changing the zoning? For example, when they look to change the zoning at Compromise Street and the whole thing for the uh, yacht club, did they say, well, let's go check the comprehensive plan and see yeah, what that's, we're Yeah, that's part of the process. Did they? Uh, and I, I think. Did they? My, my, my opinion is, is that it's often lip service. Okay. But because but also because these plans are pretty high level, you sort of drive a truck through them. You know, it, it's it's very it's very subjective. What's consistent to one person might not be consistent to another person. Well, and also because um, it's advisory, you're not, you're not Exactly. Buying. I mean, the, the only thing that you have to do is check to make sure it's consistent, but that's pretty subjective. Is there is there really a point to so, having one in all honesty? Yeah, I think I think there is. I mean, have we been But I think so where I'm good think, at following what we Where I think where I think we have a disconnect is going from the top level of the uh, comprehensive plan and the sector studies to what are, what are the actual regulations in the city code make developers, you know, how do they respond to that and what the built environment ends up being? I think there's a disconnect there. Well, and, that's, that's... and, and so so part of the thing that I think there is, you know, we have I don't know what the exact numbers but like 17 32 oh, I don't know. I 32 zoning that. districts in a city of eight square miles so that's like c1 c2 neighborhood overlay all right mixed use, use professional time and everything you know else. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a million and it's almost down what? to the and these things happen over time just sort of organically you get another little somebody wants to change this we change that you're not saying those things those ideas are bad but you look Later, and now you look at our code, and it's it's kind of a mess. So I think we need to take a big picture look at revamping the entire city code. Well, and that was my point when we were talking about the elections, is because that's what every candidate said, especially Gavin said. And I'm going to try and do the accent. We got to look at the code, you know. (laughs) And and but everyone said that, and it got to be one of those things that it was it was almost not meaningless to me, but it just became one of those canned items going when they're asked going what do you think about development everyone would say well we have to look at the code and just and but no one including us no one right. ever pressed them to say what does that mean specifically? yeah i mean i think i think with respect to some of the developments especially eastport landing because there's been true well that that's shown the know, weakness true of it. true questions about you know how do you actually calculate the density so that shows a weakness
this that there's ambiguity in the code. Well, the city couldn't even agree with itself on that. Right. I mean, so, so I get these ranty think, texts from John going, have you seen this? I'm like, I'm yeah. not paying attention. I'm kind I think, of top I, level. I think the, the kinds of comments that are made about revamping the zoning code are more along the lines of, like, let's just tighten up these problems that we have with the existing code, not taking it a step back in looking at how does the code that we have determined what what actually gets built what that's the thing I, th- I think you're speci- I, th- I think you're exactly right that we're uh, well, the conversation during the elections was about plugging holes in the existing right. codes and the process like what of, well uh, well these density uh, calculations right example. okay like they're doing okay, these yeah. landing and stuff like that that's that that's can, problem can ex- there explain that a little bit because you you got really in the weeds on that one because you were you were kind of following that really closely not, not not too much i mean there was just different ways to to determine it right. i mean there at one point they said that you take the the size of the property divide it by a number and that's what you come up with your that's what the city allowable, said the allowable unit so it was 6.9 acres or whatever the hell it was and then that's what it was that's where they came up with 163 acres well somebody else interprets it now because it was never fully defined and says oh no it's the improved square footage so now you're looking at the square footage. You're basically subtracting all the parking lot and landscaping. And now that's where you're coming down to the 63 units or whatever it is that, yeah. that it is. So that's where they're in the yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily Wait, think, but, but I don't necessarily think that was a mistake per se. I think in these planned unit developments, the idea was to provide flexibility so that if there's a local context that makes you want to shift things one way or the other, you're not constrained by it says thou shalt do this. The idea was to provide some flexibility, but with that flexibility comes some ambiguity. And well, that becomes a mess because that, also well, you have, it, you right. have but, problematic but, but for sure. Let me, let me just jump back. But you, I mean, that's what the election I think was talking about. Was talking about yeah. let's let's plug these holes. Let's make this less ambiguous. Right. Let's turn around and say, you know, this is how we do. This is how we get a building. This is how we get a business open in Annapolis without going through the bullshit that we currently do. Uh, that chases people right. away. And I mean, you've talked to dozens of people that have said, oh, yeah, I was yeah. so psyched to go to Annapolis, but then, oh, oh no, you know, I just had one meeting and poof, I'm out. And, and you're talking about more of not necessarily it's sort of reinventing the vision of the zoning code, of how of, right. so of the there's code. a lot of there's a lot of different strategies you could take. And I, I'm certainly no expert, so I, I don't want to claim to be one. But what, what's sort of in vogue now that a lot of larger, both smaller and larger cities are doing, they're looking at things, what, what they call form-based codes, which are not so much, you know, you calculate, you have this setback and you calculate floor to air ratios and all this kind of planning gobbledygook. But they, it basically more says, what do you what do you want this place to look like? Because that's what I think viscerally. That's what people react to. They look at a development and they say, Ugh, I, I don't like the way that looks. They don't say, well, the floor to area ratio is wrong to have five stories, and they don't get into that. They'd say, well, what I want to we fit in here. I want to look at I want to look at a code that that I can that I can look at and interpret in a way that makes me understand what the end result's going to look like. Have you ever seen the artist's representation of what a project's going to look like afterwards when the developers come to yeah. the city? And it's always fountains in the center with like par- parks and people with dogs. And then at the end of it, it never looks like that. 1901 uh, West Street looked incredibly different than it looks now, which is just a big box. Right. So form-based codes basically give you a way to specify, you know, what the place should look like. Not, you know, not so much these very details about box sizes and setbacks and all that kind of stuff. I think that would go a long way. Another thing that I would be a proponent of is much less restrictive uses. So West Annapolis, for example, what you can do along Annapolis Street, if you want to open a business along Annapolis Street, oftentimes you might want to do something that's not a permitted use. You know, it's not like you're putting a steel smelting factory in there. So, so as an example, we had to modify the zoning code to allow Pilates studios. So somebody had somebody wanted to open a Pilates studio. Because that's a gym. Yeah, right, or whatever. But the idea was that was not a permitted use. You think because that was not a permitted use, anybody cares whether there's a Pilates studio there? That's clearly a use that's, uh, you know, not, uh, not so obnoxious, there. right? But the fact that they had to go through a four-month process to get that use change to open a building... It's ridiculous. Cause so then- you're looking at, so there's one side of me, or there's a bunch of sides where you go, you look at, say, well, who would object to that? And, and you say, common sense, if I'm sitting in zoning, I'm like, yeah, of course. But someone in zoning who's doing a CYA is going, hey, wait a minute. 
I got to do this by the book. You know, I don't want someone to come to me in two months. And when, if there's a problem, yeah, so, say, so what it. I would say is have you still need some sort of uses because, you, you know, again, you don't want somebody to put a delivery warehouse in a residential neighborhood. Clearly, that's not a compatible use. But I think the, the categories of uses could be much more broad, which would allow much more easy reuse of the existing buildings as the economy changes and it just makes it more flexible. Right. Well, so, it makes sense. You turn around for a Pilates or something, uh, you know, yeah. gy- gyms or, at, you know, athletic things not to exceed X square feet or yeah, something. something along right. those lines. So I'll tell you what, let's uh, get a refill. I, I can't help notice when my beer is empty. All right. <laughs> so why don't we take a break? We'll rehydrate, which is very important in this sort of situation. We'll come back and we'll solve all the problems at zoning. Good deal. Of all the ways our customers can describe us, nothing means more than being their favorite. Zachary's is the gold standard in customer service. This is the absolute best jewelry buying experience of my life. The annual holiday party for their customers is beyond a memorable experience. They have the most exquisite jewelry and the store atmosphere, it's the best around. They listen and there's never any pressure to buy. We've purchased fine jewelry from different big names in the Baltimore area. But we were treated like family at Zachary's. You'll not find a nicer group of people. They have my business for life. Best in Annapolis is is simply not enough. Zachary's has been a part of many of my life's best memories. After it's all said and done, there's one jewelry store that's my absolute favorite. Zachary's. Online at Zachary'sJewelers.com. More than a jewelry store. A jeweler. When you're a community bank, you help your community however you can. Like being there for local business people, backing them up when they start up, advising them when they ask, standing by them so they can grow. Helping local businesses is one of the most important things we do at Severn Bank. I'm Alan Hyatt, Chairman of the Bank, but I'm also a proud supporter of businesses in Anne Arundel County. You know we never forget that here at the bank, we're a local business too. We face the same challenges and opportunities as any business. And we know how fortunate we are to have customers who stand beside us. That's why we stand beside you. If you have a business or you want to start a business, talk with us. Because we're banking on you. Severn Bank, here with you. Online at SeverinBank.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Severn Bank is a trade name used by Severn Savings Bank. And we all have our beers. I've got uh, Stella, and John's got a Stella, and what do you got? You have flying a, dog. a flying dog. Flying dog. I'm a yeah. I'm a local. I'm a local. Alex is supporting local. Yeah. I we're am gonna mention, we're importing, you're going to mention what the name of it it's is. It's a dog, <laughs> dog, doggy style. Nice. <laughs> yeah, pale and, then, and then they've got Raging Bitch, and um, yeah. there's another one they've got. I can't remember their. My, my, uh, probably my favorite is Loose Cannon because it's. Well, I like the name too, but it, it, it's, I mean, that's about. I can't do IPAs. Close. They're too bitter for me. I, like, uh, I do Miller Lite. It's kind of an acquired taste. I do Miller sure. Lite, Stella, and Guinness. Those are like my big. I got turned on to some of the. Uh, I want to call it fruity beers, but not the fruit infused beers, Ugh. but the sour, the sours. Right, I guess is right, what they're right. called, which are kind of cool. I hate fruit fruit beer. I went out with Liz Murphy. That's Annapolis Pint. You got to listen to her podcast. And we went out, and she picked some really cool beers. My wife appreciated everything, uh-huh. and they were fine. But at the end, I just want to go home and have more light. <laughs> I am so trailer park. She's, she, she's probably like cringing now. She I'll, is. Right? I'll tell you, one time we were at Bar Oak, and she recommended this uh, triple Degar. Teresa and I were drinking it and on the 4th of July and it was something like three beers and we were just all absolutely plastered it was we went back and looked and it was like an 11 point something or other it's like 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 a double IPA yeah the old Stein Inn out there you have like one beer and you are just flying I'm like turning over the keys to one of my kids (laughs) my my favorite just to give a, a plug to probably something nobody's ever heard before but I've heard of uh, a lot of stuff, Alex. A brewery in Milton, Massachusetts, ah. makes this makes this IPA called, and just the name is awesome. It's called Boom Sauce, <laughs> and it come in four packs of sixteen ounce cans. Boom Sauce, and it's. It's maybe the best IPA. Ever. Did you guys yeah, grow up really drinking um, Mickey's, or is that a regional thing? The Mickey's M- Wide Mouth, the big yeah, mouth, yeah, yeah. yeah. The grenades. Remember, you'd slice your finger open when you're opening the top of them. They yeah. turned them to like the turn. You never had those, John? Uh-uh. 
They were, they were like these, they looked like hand grenades. And they had like these. Right, it was almost like a barrel shape. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was like a glass And they were barrel. small. They were probably yeah. 10 ounces or something. probably for ease in throwing. You would pull the top off. It was like a two process thing where you'd pull the top and you have to spin it and tie it. And everyone you would just slice your slice finger. Your finger. Yeah. Just huh. everyone. It was and then, just, of course, and, you know, being from Massachusetts, we had uh, your mass hole. old froth and slosh. Jeez. I do know. I re- yes, remember the hearing that. Yes. with the foam on the bottom. What? Yeah. That's, I, I don't know if you could still, if they still make it anymore. I want that just to you try could get it. Foam on you know, the bottom. You could get it in Kenmore Square in Boston. Uh, so you don't have the accent. So, you, yeah, so John's a Philly guy. You're a mass guy. I'm the only semi-local guy. Well, I love the names oh. of uh, some of the beers that, you know, like say, the uh, craft beers are out there. They're sort of reminiscent of like the uh, the hot sauces that you yeah. see at the... Uh, like yeah. the, oh, yeah, the uh, California maker. tortilla yeah. and you know well you got the burn your ass you know whatever it may be but it's uh, kind of funny but we were talking we were talking about a holy look W-H-O-L-L-Y I guess that's Holly um none we, of the W it's near Christmas holistic you mean Holistic? Holistic? I don't know. We're, we're looking at a big picture look at, you know, looking at development and looking at as opposed to on a project basis, I guess. You know, we were talking about this. We were, I was talking to someone about this recently where they were complaining about work. And I said, the biggest problem, I think, with any job you ever have is differentiating between uh, the work that you do and then the deep work. And no one ever gets the opportunity to do deep work. When I used to supervise people, I would try and allocate time like once a week where they could do deep work. But it, mm-hmm. mostly it was task oriented. And I think that municipalities and city governments, state government, all governments are the same way, is that there's no innovation because they're just trying to do what you need to get by. So when right. we talk and, about you know, redoing. Typically staff's got a million projects. Right. They're just trying to be as responsive as so they can to projects. Unless you have a commission. To assign a commission yeah. to rewrite the code, which is a daunting task. I mean, you and I were talking in the break mm-hmm. about Miami, and you said if they can do it there, we can certainly right. do it here. But Buffalo, I mean, New York did also. But what's the impetus to, to cause a municipality to do that? At what point would the municipality just throw down? Well, I think, I think a, a, a municipality often, like a place like Buffalo, will look at what their built environment is and why it's not working and because they have Problems. You, know, you see this in Rust Belt cities too. Mainly that they're in Buffalo. <laughs> well, I mean, economically, they're, they're not doing well. So they say, well, what, what, uh, what's preventing economic growth in the city? And so they look at all the regulations they have and say, well, this is clearly not working. Let's do something else. So in bad times, when often you don't have anything to lose, it's easier to do that. If, if you're in good, pretty good shape, and then you know, I put an apple. Play it safe. You can play it safe. And, well, you and I were also talking uh, in the break that. So, what are the issues that are endemic? Like, but I think we we have those issues here. They're just a little bit below the surface. Like uh, what? Well, the fact that we have a debt problem in the city. You know, I mean, we have well, all city. All cities do. Right, but I mean, if you look at if you look at our debt, and that's something Ross Arnett's you know brought up over mm-hmm. and you know this was it was this was something that that uh has been you know was part of the election you look at our the the debt we've assumed over the last four years and it has gone up not a lot but it has gone up a lot of that is you know we have to be careful about the things that we have to finance like the hillman garage that's a transportation issue that plays into okay if we have ways to get around that are not so autocentric Maybe it takes a little pressure off needing as much parking. Right. So the zoning thing. So, so now we're getting to kind of kissing cousins. We get an yeah. overlap. So which is well, it is. It, I mean, they are they are no 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 kissing but, cousins. No, but what I'm the, saying is, or so if we're talking about pro like business administrations, which we've not had in a long time. I'm not picking on anyone. It's just because you have people who've not owned businesses who are running a government and they don't see the importance of businesses. I'm not faulting them, but I, I am saying that we we've, we've always contended that it doesn't matter if a business is successful or not because your property taxes are going to be the same regardless. So what does it matter if you have a boarded up building or you have a thriving business? The city has never had a dog in the fight when it comes to promoting business interests because they don't care. And I don't mean that cynically i just mean why would they because they're not making more money right. so if you're talking about rewriting the zoning code that's not going to do that that's strictly that's not going to affect that's, I mean, the fact that's strictly that, on revenues because you're talking about yeah. the way that is that a property is taxed or the way that right. a I don't building think that, is built i don't think that has anything to do with a building owner on main street saying well i don't care whether the bu- building's uh, empty or not there's really nothing the government the city government can do about that 
I mean, Wait, they, now we're, now we're they could spinning. they could do something, but it would it would be very anti-competitive or very well. But but it comes down to let's say um, that you, if you if you look at Compromise Street and the big problem with that was that was zoned for maritime. You had to have a maritime business in there, and I think the contention was, well, wait a minute, we are not a maritime. We are not a maritime city anymore. We are not. We 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 are pleasure cruises and boating but you you don't have watermen here anymore you you have like what one right. sailmaker you know in town which is i think maybe out of the city well i mean without without uh, you know i know this is sort of sacrilege to a lot of people but i think the maritime uses in eastport and back bay certainly there's a lot of maritime business there and that is right. really important the, but it's the, zoned for the, that the, already. That's not but, a city no, line. but the district, the district down, the maritime. There are three maritime districts, and but the one downtown, I think there's a, a valid argument to be made that that's a day that's not here anymore. Yeah. So, so that's my point is that if you rezone that and you fix the zoning, because you had someone there who bought the building, said, "Look, I want to, right. I want to make this into a booming center down here," and they they felt that their hands were tied because they had to find a maritime industry, which they did. Um, but at the same time, what, do, they, do you have to make them jump through hoops? So then it is incumbent upon the gov- city government where you say, look, we're going to rezone this in a way to make it easier to develop, which is going to... Well, but then we're back to my original argument. Well, so it doesn't if matter. you had something like a form-based code, what, around City Dock, what you really care about is n- not necessarily what's the programming inside the building. You know, I know, a lot, I know a lot of people don't like Chipotle, but I don't care, whatever. Chipotle can be there... I don't. And then, but you know, whatever. And then they close up. Somebody else can go in there. So that's the programming. What, what I really care about is what's the form of the building. So take 110 Compromise Street. What, what people are really upset about, I think, is what does the building look like? Not what goes in it or what activities, what uses happen in it and what the, the mix of the, the retail is. Pe- what people really viscerally care about is what's it going to look like? Do they care? Yeah, I think... I think people really care about it. That's that's why people didn't like the Ordan plan because they thought it just uh, didn't. you just hit on they a hot just button. Didn't, well, they sure. didn't like it. I mean, they're, they're, no. they're, they're bitching about the one. No, I mean that's a, there's a whole lot of yeah, politics yeah. there too. But I've been drinking, so don't get me I started. I mean, they're bitching where uh, the building where Harvey Blonders built the uh, new Starbucks. Where the old Zachary's? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it's got the setback and it's very modern looking and it doesn't fit in with a with mm-hmm. a thing. And I, th- I, th- I think there's something to be said. I think Eastport has a specific look. I think right. downtown Annapolis has a specific look. I think West Annapolis does to a degree. Yeah. Uh, some of the outer line wards, not so much. I mean, it's a, it's a real sort of a mixed bag, um, which can be relaxed a little bit there. But I think um, I, I agree with you. You know, something like the the, the form based code will help really get to what people are thinking they they want it to look like so what happens so so if we backwards engineer this from crystal spring or, or providence point where do you end up on that because that is now in limbo yet again it has been for years right. so the big issue i don't know if it's zoning but the fact that it has to go through the city for approval so, so which this, is, i don't know if zoning would affect that the problem that i have with most of the development along forest drive is that it's, a, it's of a development pattern that's very inappropriate for cities. Take Crystal Spring, take the Giant or the Safeway, all of the new developments that have happened down Forest Drive, including the residential stuff, they're all islands in the sense that developer comes in, puts in their 100 houses or whatever they put in or their store or their age facility or whatever the, whatever the, the development is. You go in, it's this sort of landlocked little thing. And then there's the next one, and there's the next one. And the only way in and out is through the main drag forest drive. So what's that mean? Nobody wants to connect things, because I get it. Nobody wants people going Traveling between their, their thing and the right. next thing. Well, well that's, also, I mean, that's why people like, like cul-de-sacs, because, you know, they don't want through traffic. And that's why these ideas of cut-throughs are so controversial, like the one in West Annapolis that WNAB. prompted the flyer. The WNAB. The one also. over on Aris T. Right. Uh, yeah, the one to South Cherry Grove. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, uh, no. Rocky Gorge. Rocky Gorge, yeah. Oh, yeah, Rocky, Rocky Gorge is is the classic example of that, where this development pattern that was so prevalent in the '80s, this sort of suburban development pattern with the curvy streets and the and the cul-de-sacs, they put that in for Oxford Landing, but it just doesn't scale. And, you know, granted, we have we have a lot of geographical constraints on peninsulas, peninsula, so water. there's only so much you can do. But take the Rocky Gorge area. Had that been a grid of streets like Eastport or West Annapolis, where you've got maybe two or three streets that are redundant, that all can distribute traffic, if you build out at the end of that, people aren't worried like all this traffic is going to go down my one street. 
And that's the problem with, with Rocky Gorge. That's what's caused all that problem. Is the people in Oxford Landing say, well, these 45 houses are all going to every morning go past my street. But you know what? You do have problem. that in Apple. So already, that's already existed. So if you look at between Forest Drive and Eastport, you've got uh, Bay Ridge and Chesapeake. So those are the only going one way, going the other. Those, that's the only way that you can get to downtown from that direction. You can only get from using West Street and then Bestgate, Rao rather. But so well, Annapolis is kind of built that road. way. What's that? You also got spawn chinka pound off. But that, that dumps you. But that dumps you either onto Forest or Bay yeah, Ridge. Yeah, I mean, so the problem but, is there's no there's really there's really no easy answer here because with, you know with a, a piece yeah. of but paper. And this is always my complaint uh, with with other people who said that. But let's we're, not make we're a situ- colonial. But let's not make right. But we're, we're but, a three hundred year old, three hundred fifty year old city. I, I get that, and that's no, that's you don't, ex- Alex. I don't think you do. That's, that's an existing condition. But there are places like out on Forest Drive where it's a greenfield. So what do we do? We just keep doing the same old thing. A what field? In a green field. What's that? Well, maybe it's brown or <laughs> black or whatever from the blacktop that was there. You know, Infield it's not. Development? Yeah. Well, I mean, th- so take the Le- the Leedy's. Lidl? Lidl is going to go. Lidl. That whole area. Lidl. That part of Lidl. I can remember how to it's pronounce It's with needles. But so that, that whole that. part of Bay Ridge, you know, that could have been a neighborhood like West Annapolis or Eastport or something. But instead what we do is we just continue to do the same old, same old. What, what, so what? Be- why do we do that? Because that's what our code says. You look at our subdivision regulations. They say they discourage connecting streets. What's that, what it actually says, minor streets should not be connected. Minor streets? Yeah. So like your little residential street. What that says is build cul-de-sacs. Right. That's what that says. So this is why I say we have this disconnect between what the comprehensive plan says, you know, we want this, you know, this certain look, but then what actually gets built is not that because the regulations, what the developers have to follow. And, you know, developers, for the most part, I don't think are bad people. They're like anybody else. Oh, yeah, they're bad. To, they're horrible. Trying to make a living. I mean, not, <laughs> some of them, sure. If someone touches but, Ebb Tide, I'm going to lose my shit. Some, you know, everybody's trying to, trying to do the right thing. No, they're not. But if... The right thing for them. I mean, look, we have, there's a very prominent developer. He's a very nice guy and everything, but he would pave over the city if he could. And, and I, I am one of those guys, like, I believe in property but we rights. Let that, well, but we let that happen because but you, of the, but way you, our, well, the way our rules are written. How many CVSs do we need? And the, there's someone who looks at me and goes, but it's their property. And I get that. But just there's a part, like, I, I grew up in Montgomery County, as John knows, and it, I just watched my neighborhood disappear. Like, if I go back to visit my mom right now, it, there's nothing I recognize from when I grew up. So that's a nostalgic selfish thing that I don't want things to change and I think most people are like me so we talk development that means change yeah. and it, it doesn't generally mean for the better you know it just because it changes things that that are endearing to you right um, and I well, think that's I mean that's another that's another aspect another facet to, and people romanticize to, to the whole it. thing Mexican cafes that, food hoards was horrible so it's it, you know as this as this area becomes more interesting to people who want to move here if we say okay no more development we we don't want the character of the the city to change we're not going to build anything else we're just going to keep it like it is it's like word one yeah what's what's going to happen is that's going to insanely raise land values Mm -hmm. i mean we're we're already seeing that because supply is constrained so the value goes up and what ends up happening is you price people out of the the ability to live in the city all right so we got like 10 minutes left so i want you to revise the zoning code now. Tell me what what if you're uh, in charge. It's not really zoning code either. It's just, it's well, just so a, so a couple uh, of things that I've said. I, I think going to a more form based, loose, loosening up on the uses. Like go, you had to you, you had to break those down. Like form based means what? Meaning, have the rules based on what things are going to look like and how they're going to function. You know, how does a building address the street? But doesn't that open it up to interpretation? No, I think I think is it from the the form based codes that I've looked at. They can be uh, very tight, but they result in a, a very specific look. Who? Of, of how uh, and you said the porn-based codes that you've looked at. What cities have? So, if, if people are looking to go to go get just get a flavor for that, I mean, first thing you can do, you go to Wikipedia and look at the article on porn-based codes. It's a good. Oh, article. I will. Okay. Uh, but there's also <laughs> a site, and I have nothing. The disclaimer: I have nothing to do with these people. I've just read their stuff. There's an organization called Placemakers, and it's a consulting business. Placemakers? So, placemakers. So placemakers.com. And they have examples from a variety of different cities that they've done 
form-based codes for of different sizes. So you can go and they have case studies to give you a sense of what, what they've done. So those, those are the kinds of things you can look at. Of course, do you know about rewriting so, the code? Is that something that is done, and, I, and I, I'll show my ignorance here, is that something done by the law office, or is that something that the city could hire Place yeah, planning, planning and zoning, that would be an activity that planning and zoning would un undertake. Or no, could, but, he, but he's could right. They, could they hire placemakers to come evaluate their code yeah, and rewrite I, it into a form? I mean, that's the way this is always done. We don't have this, you know, we have a staff of, what, 10 people in planning and zoning. They can't do this on their own, plus do their day jobs. Right. So typically it's, I mean, typically you hire a consultant that has uh, domain expertise here. So you have... The city would make a political decision. The city government would make a political decision. We want to do something with our zoning code. We have this idea of the way we want to go based on maybe our comprehensive plan. So they go out and look for the right consultant. So clearly, you're not going to go hire a consultant that you know has planning dogma from 1980. You're going but to go it's not, hire it's somebody not just with a expertise. consultant. It's someone who's coming in is going to leave you with a package that you can yeah. you can tweak yeah. on your own. At least that's a yeah. starting point, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And you know that might take two or three years. It's not going to be an easy process. Oh sure, yeah, but I it mean, can be done. Interesting, because um, I mean that's certainly something that I know that Gavin Buckley was you know advocating. I mean everybody really was. I mean Gavin and his. Take an abandoned store on Main Street and put a clock in there. Yeah. You know. But Alex is right. I mean, uh, I think if you're looking at planning and zoning in the abstract where people say, yeah, we need to fix it. But I don't think I've never heard of any specifics as to right. what exactly uh, needs to be fixed. You know, and I think yeah. if you press I think a lot people of people, are just they're just going to do more little tweaks that if you look at all the tweaks we've done over the years, that's gotten us, gotten us into this aggregate mess. So the, when you're in a hole, what's the first thing you do? I start digging. You, you continue digging? You start digging. Yeah, but that's my personality. Yeah. yeah. You know, you stop digging, right? No, yeah, you yeah. Do something different. Yeah, you don't know me that well, do you? So, <laughs> I mean, so that's, that's my suggestion. Uh, it not, not focus so much on uses because that constrains what, you know, what you can do in that building. And, and that makes it a little bit more fragile in terms of accommodating changes in the economy. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, do you think the... City under a new mayor has the political will. Do you know what's your what's your thought uh, on that? Do they have the political will to do that to undertake that? I think we have a better chance now now than we did before. Uh, you know, because I mean the the uh, referendum I think in the city election was based on whether you like the status quo or whether you want change. Sure. And, and you know, I think the voters spoke. I, I think it was a resound, resounding change. message that yeah. was sent out there for sure. Uh, what um, I mean, where do you see the fire hoses? And that just a term is like what's going to stop the political will. Where is the fire hose? Is Ward 1 going to object uh, to this? Is this going to be a, a council saying, no, we don't need to do this? Is this because the council, we've got a lot of old, you know, we've got some fresh faces, but we still have, you know, some old stalwart thinking that is. Yeah, I think it's it would take some real political maneuvering to get everybody moving in that direction. But who, who would uh, that behoove? Like, what group would have to come forward? Like, almost like, like if there's a real version of Steve Annapolis that wasn't. Well, if Ward 1 wants it done, it'll. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Um, I think the city council will have to all get in that direction, and clearly they'd have to, to solicit input from their constituents. And if their constituents say, whoa, no, I, that's, too, that's just too much change, then clearly they're not going to be interested in, in pursuing that. Again, my ignorance, um, could a code so, be changed per ward? That's so ignorant, John. Like I don't see why not. I mean, we do have these so overlays. Uh, you know, we ha you, especially in Eastport has an overlay that sort of helps maintain the character. Right. Uh, so I think it could be done, and and that's what the sector sector studies are right. for uh, to bring the indiv individual flavor to the neighborhood. So you're not imposing necessarily the same set of rules on every. On All right. What place. about your bike so. bike paths, Alex? Uh, oh, of course, we need more. More ways to get around. You know what? I we need do, more ways to get around on a bike that are safe. I will agree with you on that because my kids were stuck out on a peninsula, and for them to it's two miles right. for them to get to civilization. And I'd like them to do and it. And a but, kid can ride a bike a, a bike two miles without it. Yeah, yeah. So, stick. but we but every time right. someone says we need more bike paths, logistically. I, like that, we have one bike path in town. Well, we have more, but we have that one that goes from in front of Safeway that goes nowhere. The yeah. bike path nowhere. But that, uh, I would like to bring, see. Interesting, you bring that it's up. There's I bring no that up. reason. There is no reason that that same multi-use trail because it's 10, 10 feet of blacktop. Long, it's, long. <laughs> yeah, no. Right. Ten feet wide. Oh. That there's no reason that couldn't go all the way. 
to uh, Quiet Waters Park. I'd, I'd love to there's see that. There's no reason. Well, you, that you also be. look at what uh, there's, there's. I mean, you're gonna have to. That way, they wouldn't right have to away, blow but, through stop signs. No, but you're not gonna have to. You're not gonna have to knock anybody's house down to do it, and you're not gonna have to take any way any travel lanes. You could do it. I was so furious at a biker uh, the other day because they blew through a red light right in front of me, and I was gonna honk, and I thought Alex would yell at me <laughs> if I did this. I actually thought that. I thought he'd be so mad at me. Well, you know, you know, you look what they're doing at the Severn so, River Bridge. I mean, they've taken what, what is it? Four lanes, and they're making the six, or six are making eight, whatever. I, I whatever they're making it is. four, four. I, I mean, they're, they're, lanes they're, just, they're just shaving the lanes a little bit. And I mean, to be honest with you, on Forest Drive, you could probably do that from Chinkapin all the way down. No, 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 not not that one spot where it kind of oh, curves. Oh, right there, in. Where, right there where Hilltop comes. Yeah, in. that that's a tricky one. Well, then you then you could pop up there and use that that macadam uh, thing. But I mean, I would think that I mean, we don't have any roads. I don't believe that exceed 40 miles an hour mm. in the speed limit well, within the city. Well, on yeah, I, 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 I didn't do it. Yeah, 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 and, and, I mean, na- narrowing n- narrowing streets in a city. I mean, that's traffic notice, calming. I mean, no, notice I use the term street, and not road. So, you, oh, I did notice have, that. Have you seen this concept of a strode, which is a street road hybrid? <laughs> It, You're drunk. That's, I mean, that's any place that has a 35 to 50 mile an hour speed limit, you could consider a strode. Typically, four to six or eight lanes wide. Route two in parole is that. If you've ever gone from Edgewater to, you know, up to Route 50 on Route two, right? What do you think your, you, especially when there's any traffic, what, what do you think your average throughput, you know, if your average speed's going to be? It's probably going to be probably about 40 mile an hour. No, no, it's no. going to be like on a Saturday afternoon. No, you're lucky if you have 20 John. miles an hour. Yeah. The whole way. Okay. But what ends up happening is you go from stoplight to stoplight, from zero to forty-five to zero. Yeah. Zero to forty, and that's hard. I mean, if you, have you ever tried to cross Route Two as a pedestrian to go over to town side? I don't walk anywhere. That's... You should try it sometime. It's no, sobering. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, my legs get tired. Really unpleasant. Well, I think you know when I lived in Albuquerque, it was all grid. It was all east, west, north, south. Right. So when you flew in at night, it was like really cool, and then it would just end at the desert. But all the lights had the signs on them saying lights are timed for forty, and then I always thought, well, they're also timed and for eighty. You, you know, at that, but if that, you get if you get hit by a car at forty miles an hour, you're going to die. Well, not I'm very strong, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, so we solved so, all the problems tonight, I think. Well, so one, one, last, one last development that I think is worth talking about in terms of this island idea is, you know, the Annapolis Towns at Neal Farm what? development. So it's off Old Solomon's Island Road, tucked off in that corner of the city, annex that land. Yeah, yes. Uh, and so they're going to put in... I, and I, this this came up because I saw the advertisement in the Capitol. That's sort of behind, like Sin uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that was a huge. It, that was that was a traditionally black neighborhood. Yeah. That was annexed about six years ago. So you knew right. they were going to develop. Oh, I've, I've seen they've started working so what's on a, that. Right. It, they were very upset the, with Classy about the, that. You can see the ads. You can see the ads in the Capitol because they're selling them. Now. Right. Which is but, sad because that was like a that was like a, th- a throwback neighborhood. You know, that, and that's true. the part of me that makes me sad. But no one asked. I mean, the the world goes on. I mean, I that's not something that we can deal with. No, with that attitude. Uh, but the problem that I have with w- the way that's been done is that that townhouse development doesn't integrate with the rest of the community. And, and, and it was by design. Yeah, but, yeah, you go in there, the there's one way in and one way out. And the city didn't push it. But what's going to happen eventually is the next plot, the next couple of plots are going to get sold, and they're going to put in probably another new place. And then all these places are going to be unconnected. So one of the things that I think the city should do is they should force these connections. So thinking about the NAV thing, and I know both of my, the, the Fred Payone and right. Kurt Regal both were against connecting. Right. And my comment was, why don't you connect it from both places? That way you've got the ability to get through in case you ever need to reroute traffic. If you're worried about through traffic... Put in big speed bumps. Put in traffic furniture. Put in all the stuff that if you the, drive the, faster... The traffic calming that you need to put in. But if you drive faster than 10 miles an hour, you're going to hit something. But connect them. Because that way, if you're riding a bike, as an example, you don't have to go a mile out of your way onto West Street. Well, if you even you go could over... Drive, you could ride through there. If you, what is that? Uh, Victor Parkway over off Bay Ridge. Right. They have big gates put across the road so you can't right. go through for that reason. Right. Yeah, I guess yeah, I never thought about that. We right. are very isolationist when it comes to our neighborhoods in this yeah. town. 
I mean, more so than anywhere like else. I, said, I've been. I, I get it. Everybody wants to live on a cul-de-sac, and that's that's well, in your own personal. And well, we're also not saying the obvious, which is the public housing issue. You know, and uh-huh. we're saying that yeah, that, there's a big part of that where you know. Yeah, you, but no, I don't. That, that's a BS argument. I'm not. I'm don't not insult me on because, my own podcast. You don't because, think Rizzuto wants to move into Admiral Heights? Come come through Admiral no, but Heights the, as but opposed the, to but the public housing thing. People say, well, I don't want. I don't want to have access to my neighborhood because somebody might walk up the road from the public house. That's BS. They're going to walk up anyway. Exactly. Uh, so, so the fence, in, the fence at Victor Parkway, it's across the road, and the gate was actually closed for a long time. Josh Cohen got it opened, and because they they stood out there at night, and there were people crawling over the fence. <laughs> so I said, well, just open the stupid gate. So now the gate's open. Right. So people are going to walk just because you don't have a connection, unless you put up a twenty foot high fence. Build a wall. Build a wall. <laughs> people are, you know, roll you're not going to stop it. people from going through there. So that's, while that might be a problem, I, you know, nobody wants, you know, somebody to, that's going to do harm in their neighborhood. Well, I don't but know. There's a couple of neighbors closing taking a, me off. Closing a road off is not going to solve that problem. That's just, I, I don't know. Somebody a wants to argument. You know, do bad, they're going to do bad. Exactly. Uh, and that's, I mean, well, we, you know, we have people breaking into cars in West Annapolis. I mean, well, you, you, you talk about the connecting the roads and, and, and keeping the bikes off of West Street as well. And you also, and I'm, I'm just thinking, because I live down on Forest Drive, I drive it all the time, mm-hmm. that if you had those connector roads between the neighborhoods that sit behind there as opposed to Forest Drive, right. uh, you're, you're going to have the people be able to go through it. But I don't think you're going to necessarily, I mean, you wouldn't see all the traffic of Forest Drive come through that neighborhood, right? Which is what I think a lot of people are sitting there saying, "Oh, I don't want all that damn Forest right. Drive traffic coming through my neighborhood." Well, no, you're not. I mean, if you're going to your house down at the end of Forest Drive, you're going to stay on Forest Drive. You're not going to cut down Bywater to go left right. on whatever the hell road they call it, Skipper's Lane. To yeah, but so, so not everybody has to ride a ride a bike. But if if you're going to drive the two two or three blocks from your house to the Giant. If there were a side street, you just take the side street because it's going to take you, you know, whatever, a minute longer. Mm-hmm. But because there's no connections, what it forces you to do is you have to come out on the forced drive. So that's the thing with these hierarchical road networks is they funnel everybody out onto the main road and then it's a mess. Hmm. So the, the traffic that's just local or churn or whatever has other ways to do it. It's, it provides some redundancy. You know what kind of traffic I do um, like? I like traffic on our Facebook page. We have a Facebook page and we have a group. So if you want to find us on Facebook, that's where you go. We also like traffic on Twitter. So we are at at MD MD Krabs Podcast. It's a little more subtle than saying shut up. At (laughs) Ion Annapolis. At Tim Hamilton 47. Where can they find you? you But I'm happy to say we didn't devolve into parking. And I can say that now because we're at the end. So we're not going to talk. That's right. Hey, and uh, if the internet gods are smiling down upon us, next week our guest will be Former gubernatorial candidate Heather Mazir. Mazir. And she has uh, launched a new thing, a new podcast, so you ought to listen to it, actually called Soul Force Politics. She had, what's her name on it? She had, um, what was her first guest? Da, 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 the singer. Uh, Melissa Etheridge. Melissa Etheridge, thank yeah. you. Yeah, 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 20 minutes to, uh, con- you know what? I'm not going to even edit that pause out, and normally I would. I'm going to let that pause sit. Okay. Because you're off tonight. They're Is BFFs. Uh, yeah, Is she we- coming to play here? I don't know, but she no, interviewed her on no, the first uh, podcast. Heather Mazur and uh, Melissa Adler are, are good friends, yeah. and she uh, allowed her to use her song for her her oh. podcast. What was her so. podcast? Her podcast is... Soul Force Politics. Soul Force or Politics. Go, Ms., you can go look up Ms. Maryland, MZ Maryland. Yes, yeah, so go subscribe to that, and subscribe to ours at Apple Podcasts and Google Play, and John has his Ion Annapolis podcast, which is excellent, by the way. Well, I'll make sure when this comes out, I'll go give you a five-star review. And give us five stars, Alex. And yeah. just, give us six stars, because Alex, Alex yeah. is and a review. For a second time. But we have other ones. We have the Annapolis podcast, of course, with uh, Scott McMullen, and we've got... Scotty the, Mac. Scotty Mac. <laughs> So, <laughs> and of course, the, the Annapolis Pint, and then more power to you with Josh Cohen. Speaking of Josh, those are all great podcasts. So, of course, subscribe to them and give them some reviews and some stars because they could use it too. So, Alex, this was awesome. All right. Well, thank I, you for having me again. Whenever, I, I, I now enjoy I can never have you during the day because you, you to me, it's like a Pavlovian response that you are a drinking podcast from now all on. All right. So, uh, I'm always which means that if we meet at 8 a.m., we yes. got a drink. I'm just, uh, we'll take a nap around noon. So, Alex, hey, Good. thanks Good and again. be careful uh, biking home. I will. All right. Stop at the lights. Thanks. I always do. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen.
Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.